Fishing like a local isn't just about catching fish. It's about connecting with the environment and the people who call it home. It's about hearing the stories and traditions that have been passed down for generations and sharing unforgettable moments with the people you meet along the way. Fishing like a local is having an experience that stays with you forever. And with Fishing Booker, you can experience it too, no matter where you are. Discover your next adventure on Fishing Booker. I'm Erica Lynn, and we all know the ocean is the most demanding environment on Earth, consistently testing the reliability and durability of our equipment. When you spend as much time fishing as I do, you know that reliable gear is essential for staying on the water. This is why I went with Abyss Battery to power my trolling motor, electronics, and outboard. The guys at Abyss Battery are rattling the saltwater industry by manufacturing performance marine batteries specifically designed for sonar, outboards, trolling motors, and electronic fishing reels. They're also Bluetooth compatible, so I found check Checking battery statuses right on your phone while you're out on the water is a huge game changer. To learn more about why Abyss batteries are used by the pros and factory installed by Premier Boat Builders, visit abyssbattery.com. Alright guys, welcome back to the podcast. This is episode 236. Wow, I don't think I'd ever thought that I would say that. 236. Well, this is your boy East Coast Trev and I'm joined by my good buddy Mr. Mad Man Martick. What's up buddy? Yeah, I'm here. What's up? What's up? <laughs> are you going to participate or are you just going to sit there? Yeah, I heard they get trophies out for participation now so well i especially this time of year when it's uh participation trophy time of the year right election season no well <laughs> close enough i mean let's not <laughs> or go shed, season. shed season bud that's just the way it goes right so we, we had a killer podcast this one here is with uh johnny stewart talking about pro postseason scouting to kill a buck in early season, which is a little bit different than what you would think it would be, right? But so it was fun. Really good podcast. Definitely take your notes out for this one. Johnny Stewart's he's a killer for sure. Um definitely some really good intel and information in this one to definitely get yourself through. So we're excited here. Uh coming up next weekend we will be at the Mohegan Sun Show with uh Real Outdoors TV. We've done uh couple cool things turkey season's right around the corner you know what's you know it's gonna be good it's gonna be definitely good what's the big plans for you Mardik? and what what's going on anything new mm, let me think here i got my new lighted knocks Ooh, yeah. trying, out the, trying out the halos this year so i just got uh two three packs of those i'm trying to put together a little review video for everyone to check out but uh spoiler alert uh i think i like them cool um Compared to the Nocturnals I was running before, there's a couple features that I'll uh, I'll show in the video of why I think they're better. Um, other than that, loaded up on some Black Rifle coffee cans today. Yeah, I know, dude. What? So I wanted to load up for turkey season, and uh, I think I got enough to take me right through turkey and probably through bear camp too, but can never have too much caffeine. That's right. So, yeah, and you know what's funny is when you're on the road and going, it's always good to load up. I mean, we both carry big coolers in our trucks all the time, so why not load it down with some good stuff? Um, whether whatever it is, I don't. I'm a huge espresso fan, so like, right. And you know, it only takes one or two camps with bad coffee situations to tell yourself that is never happening again. So, if that isn't the truth, dude, um, I did. I have been able i was out shed hunting with the dog the other day got invited up to uh to somebody's farm help him try and find some big antlers uh on on some great deer found a couple antlers it was great to be out um excited for you know this coming up monday mondays are my day off so i gotta get into this public piece again i gotta find some more antlers man like it's mm. it's frustrating me 
But I, it's not the end all be all. I'd rather kill the deer, but I mean, to get the intel, I think I got the intel that I need. I just have to make sure. And one of the things is, you know, it's funny is like talking to Johnny Stewart, talk, talking to Moose, talking to, you know, uh, Pottinger. Sure. Like, it nerves me to the fact of like I figured out what what works or what worked last season, but just scared that they're not going to do the same thing in the same area next year. So like. A little, I'm a little, I'm nervous. I'm nervous because you like, have a plan. I mean, definitely have a plan B, right? Like, definitely have a plan B. Found some antlers off of a, a real good buck, and definitely going to be a really good buck next year. Um, I'm going to, you know, put cameras in there and hopefully try and kill them early season, right? And but I'm just nervous that with the amount of intel that I had gotten and what I had seen in that one spot. Like, you know, and when you listen to podcasts, and I know that I think, I think that everybody is kind of in this situation where if they listen to this, they're trying to relate it to their situation, whether it was from Troy, whether it was from Ryan Glittinger, what it was from Glitzky, sorry, or it was from, you know, now Troy, um, uh, Johnny Stewart, like you're trying to put that into your scenario. Like, all right, so they do this and they do that. And then like, you're thinking of your couple of spots and it was like, there's a couple, you know, I listened to this past couple of podcasts and like, I'm thinking of public land that I had past hunted, but now I'm going to try and go back in there and see like what happened. Um, but just nervous. Like I found it out, got the X, found that spot where you know that you're in that make a couple of fine tune adjustments, but like, are they going to be in that same flat next year? It's a scary. It's a scary thought. It's 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 like, where do you and and no? I think more or less to that is like knowing the lay of the land and scouting this whole entire thing. Like, I don't know where else they would go from that spot. Like that spot is too good. You know what I'm saying? Like, like yeah. you you. There's no other activity or no other stuff in that greater area like it would have to be a very big move to go somewhere else to be in that same type of area with that same type of terrain features like it if that makes any sense i would think you you've got a pretty good chance you're gonna be the same next year the only thing that could really change that is some kind of extreme an outside cause like a logging operation or something like that right other hunting pressure, which you can't control, that right. could bump the deer somewhere else. I don't think you really have to worry about an acorn crop because there's so many oaks place. there. Huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So many oaks there. Like, even if half those trees don't produce next year, the other half are going to, you know? So I, I don't think it'll be food source. The cover's all going to be the same. I mean, I, I, I have a feeling that's just one of those. I think so, too. I- yeah. But you won't know until next year. and Early and season gotta, getting in there, put the cameras on the scrape, start the thing. I, chase just, sign. Huh? Just chase sign if they're not just there. Just chase sign, fine. right. Yeah, but and that's what makes me nervous. Like, I have two different spots where are going to be, like, kill tree spots, right? But, like, what if they don't explode in that spot? Now I have two stands in two spots that are useless. And it's like, but that's part of the game, right? And I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm playing out scenarios and just listening. But, like, it's... It's exciting. It's exciting to talk to a couple of really big killers over the past couple of weeks. If you guys haven't listened, go back and listen to them because it makes you start to think and really turns the world on what you should be doing this time of year. Like truly, truly to be yourself successful. So, um, yeah, let's get into the sponsors unless you got anything cool, uh, any killers corners, anything crazy. It's not really. No, just, um, uh... We got to see the killer this weekend at Beard, yeah, we Beard Cason, but he he said he took the day off. He said he didn't kill anything that day, but um, <laughs> even killer's got to take a day off here or there. So. That's right. <laughs> season. As you get older, you take off whole off seasons and stuff. It's weird. <laughs> oh, all right, guys. We are presented by Huntworth, HuntworthGear.com. If you haven't gone over and got your Durham pants, you are missing out. I promise you there's a special shell running on there right now. What's that, Steve-O? 20% off, I think, or something like that. I got it for you right here. It's, uh, the promo code is T-R-K-Y-M-2-0. That's 20% off. And then to piggyback off that, they've got solid color Durham pants, Winstead rain gear, 
Torrington jackets and pants, the Lottie Lodi backpack are 50% off if you use that. I think they're 30% off plus the 20% promo code. Cool. And then and then everything else that I didn't mention is 20% off with the promo code. Fantastic. Now it's time to do it 50% off, guys. Don't miss out on that. I promise you, you won't. And, and if, you know what, for some reason, and I'll make this bold statement, if you don't like it, let us know. We'll definitely, uh, I, I'd almost send you a check in the mail because it, it's worth it. It really is honestly worth it. Um, Latitude, Latitude Outdoors, guys. Go on and check them out. They're also running some sales. The last thing that I knew about was the knee pads, but there's always good stuff going on in there. Big changes over there, so make sure to follow them on all social media. Looked like they had a new podcast come out called The Method. Um, go and follow those guys over at Latitude Outdoors. Time to build your climb. Get ready for the saddle season. I 100% recommend if there was one thing that I could buy from them, it would definitely be the Carbon SS6. Hands down, mm-hmm. probably one of the best tools of equipment that they have over there at Latitude Outdoors. Nor'easter game calls, Nor'easter game calls, get them in close, guys. Um, now is the time to be buying those uh, mouth calls, practicing with them, uh, pot calls, turkey box calls. We have the through calls, which we call the Ridge Runner. Um, just a little bit of everything getting into the next seasons. Um, we, you know, deer calls, uh, crow calls. Pretty much anything you can think of. So get on over to NorEasterGameCalls.com and uh, see what you can get. Saddies LLC. Guys, check him out on all social media platforms. That's the way to get through to him. Instagram, probably the best. Just type in Saddies LLC or just look at any of our posts. Probably tagged there. I can promise you that. Um, so go and check him out and get all of your TSS for all of your needed turkey season this coming up. Um, and last but not least, Bowhunters United. Bowhunters United, the advocate for us as bow hunters, a free sign up membership with them to kind of keep what's going on in the political world. So, well, I guess without further ado, um, let's get Johnny Stewart on and uh, let's kick this bad boy right into high gear. All right, guys, we are back on the phone with Johnny Stewart. How are we doing, Johnny? Doing good, man. You know, getting ready for hunting season, even though it's, I don't know, eight months away, <laughs> whatever, nine. <laughs> well, it never actually stops, does it? I don't think, I think yeah. the next season starts the, the last day that the other season stops, I guess, for all of us guys that are hardcore into it and ready to rock and roll. That's for sure. And I ended this year, like, being so close, my hunting in January, and it just, I didn't want it to end, you know, and there's years I've ended the season kind of drained and happy it was over but this year i was kind of in hunt mode and wanted to keep killing and you know so it's kind of fueling my fire for for next season pretty good i bet you if you don't if you don't end the season dead you're just so much more fired up to just keep it going and just have that that drive i guess cliche um to keep it going yeah definitely i uh but I start working, I have an excavation business and it kind of, I get sidetracked with my, you know, my real love, you know? <laughs> and, uh, so I did go North, um, to shed hunt here this weekend. And, and, you know, once I get there, I just, I get into that mode and I don't want to leave again. You know, I get, it just, it just turns back on my obsession, you know, and, but man, it's a good obsession, you know? Yeah. It's not, it's not a, it could be way worse. It could be chasing yeah. girls around the bar room. It's I guess it's better to be out in the woods, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Hell yeah. <laughs> Less trouble there. Uh, mm-hmm. why, why don't we put this thing in four-wheel drive? Why don't you tell everybody who you are, where you're from, and a little bit about what you do? Yeah, I'm Johnny Stewart. from. Uh, I live near Pittsburgh, just south of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, hunting public land deer, whitetails, uh, probably seriously for the last 10 years. I uh, grew up hunting in around pits, not in the city, but, you know, outskirts, suburbs. Um, we had some, you know, dairy farms and, and country type land. Then, you know, they started building houses and um, we kind of learned how to hunt near houses and backyards. And, you know, in my 20s, um, in the mid 20s and um, got into mature deer, um, being obsessed with them and in kind of dabbling in public land, you know, in my twenties, then kind of went full bore in, into probably late twenties, 30 public land. So yeah, I keep saying eight, 10 years. Now it's probably 12, 14 time flies. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but, 
but um, <laughs> you're still after. Yeah, that. so hunt, you know, four or five different states a year, and see if I can't come out with some uh, some good bucks. It's just to me, it's a it's a challenging thing when you're out there. A lot of mountain deer, you know, Pennsylvania, West mm-hmm. Virginia, some Ohio, and but also, you know, I get into the Midwest, whatever, and. Like you said earlier, what state do I like to hunt? And it's whatever state I'm in, it's in hunting deer, you know. So, so yeah, I had a lot of luck and learned a lot from the animals themselves. Didn't really, maybe early 20s, just kind of quit reading magazines and just, I was just a student of the, the deer itself and asked myself questions and figured it out as I went. So, um, and would walk in the forest even before, like Spartan Forge and mapping apps until I, like I talked earlier, you just have a vision in your head how you could you could close your eyes and see um, what the deer sees and how to get from point A to point B. That really helped, you know, but also learning from the animals themselves and don't and always ask yourself questions and figure it out. And so it brought me to where I am. And, you know, I feel like I, I know a lot, but, you know, all the good hunters that I know are not they're kind of humbled where they don't tell you how it's done and or how you should do it and they know everything because you know um you'll never know anything everything you know it's all it's never ending learning cycle with these animals and after this year even i was like how i thought my season was going to go or i plan on um maybe harvesting a deer it 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 went completely polar opposite where i end up hunting or what deer i was hunting and and like i'm shifting a different gear to where i want to you're always learning but i feel like i always jump around to different like i said shift gears like you know where i what i plan on doing you know how i want to hunt but um so yeah i've I've shot three i got three deer this year three buck with a bow on public land um came close in late season few states um but like i said it just fuels me for next year um and yeah, that's that's about it, man. So so my question is and and I bet you a lot of people want to know this too and especially myself traveling kind of like what do you do to kind of like divide and conquer and get yourself ready for that next state? Like are you just taking your woodsmanship that you've learned from past seasons to be successful or are you taking trips to certain states every single year to learn in the off season too or are you just reading the sign as it as it comes and as it lays that at the time that you're there? Well, lately, I've been hunting these same states and kind of sticking with the same areas Mm -hmm. um, to the even point to where I'm not even take like when I go out to the Midwest, I'm like, I didn't even have cameras. I just knew there was good deer where I was and I seen a good one the last day Um, and I threw a camera up while I was there. But there's times in the past where I drive 12 hours to put cameras for a day or two and then come home to, to learn that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but now I don't really have to, I kind of know what the areas hold, but uh, I hunted Illinois this year, um, some new areas, but just kind of um, going with my woodsmanship and kind of, um, you know, scouting is like, my motto is like scout more, hunt less. And, and until you you find what you're you're looking for and start hunting, you know? could have some meat on a bone but um but a lot of the states now are just like northern pa from pittsburgh it's two and a half hours so i figured i needed i need two trips this year in the spring to uh like i said scout for for as we talked before we were on air here um basically scout for next year i know a lot of areas and and i can get like once I get up there and scout, I know I'm home and getting into my excavating. And once I get up there, you know, I'm wanting to scout my few areas. And, and like I said, we'll talk about like what I'm scouting for. But um, then I just like, I, I look at the map I, I and I religiously study Spartan Forge. And it's like, I want to go here. I want to go there and I can get like lost, you know, but I, I, I try to like this year, what I'm trying to focus on is like the different times of year, you know, scout per for like, uh, your early October, like coming out of summer into fall, I feel like I got like a week in my area that I can catch them still in their summer patterns. Um, so I'm like, man, I, I really want to harvest a deer early. So I just really went over um, the areas that I hunted, it, um, well, areas I knew but haven't hunted in years. 
and there were some cuts as we talked about earlier um that had some young brows um blackberry briars and so these bucks were, were feeding in there early october and um I actually found that one horn right where I was hunting early October when I went up to scout for next October. Um, but when I go in, I really want to like go through them areas with over, you know, like a fine tooth comb, like really get into where they're bedding. Like last year, I kind of knew where they were feeding, ran cameras, kind of drawing conclusions where they were bedding, but not exactly knowing. There was a beaver pond I talked about that I didn't know about down low, but I was just kind of hunting the food source and not really knowing where they're coming from. So this, this last trip, and I'll probably do one more trip that uh, up north to where I'm going to focus on that early season, um, go into like their bedding areas or where I think they're coming from or laying during the day where it's cool. Um, and like, just take note of with a Spartan Forge app, just take note of scrapes, beds, not so much rubs. I mean, they're, they're just, I feel like they randomly just, just tells you there's deer in the area especially the smaller rubs you know but the scrapes and um you know where blowdowns maybe and i can kind of i'm talking about big bull like they can bed pretty much anywhere but just kind of where i you know where the transition is in, in topography where i feel like they might be walking or where a spring might be and i can kind of you're like when you get into these bigger woods you're not going to funnel them it's going to be hard to funnel them down but but where these deer were feeding there was a transition you know it kind of was gradual steep and then gradual again and there was roads so and that's another thing use uh, being kind of close to some roads and they will be feeding down down in a bottom not many people go down i'm talking like maybe two three hundred foot elevation from the flat where them roads are down low and there's enough blowdowns and, and just irregular ground that they could kind of hide and sneak in the ferns are tall there in that area and um so uh, with the thermals, too, in the evening, that's where they're going to want to be down low. You know, it's just a no rain or there. But, um, yeah, so I don't, as far as scouting, like a lot of these states. But then again, when you come to, like, that, my area in PA doesn't have any mast. So when I go, go to states like West Virginia or Ohio, um, I kind of, if it's a spot I've been to, even if I know the area, I'll I'll, I'll go, like, end of September and, and that, and I'll just kind of walk everywhere just to find out where the mast is for that year. Mm -hmm. Cause I find a lot of the deer are doing that themselves. Like I've, I've read my cameras over the years and their noses down. Like when you get these pictures, you know, when acorns are falling, whether they're falling or not, but it's that time of year that they be falling, you'll catch these deer with their nose down, just walking. So basically you got to walk the whole forest to find you. You don't use your nose. You're just looking trying to look up in a tree it's tough sometimes but basically these deer are doing that through september into october is, is if if they don't know you know if it's like a mast thing and, and it's not the same every year um so i'll definitely in them areas hike and find the mast if that's the um like the big ticket item as far as the food source um but um you know and then other states that i've i've hunted or whether it's muzzleloader or or whatever um you know i'm going for like some of this mountain areas like i feel like a point leeward side east facing ridge you know uh finger ridge and stuff like that and kind of look mainly when i'm not i don't have the area scouted you know kind of look for where humans are going to come in and where the deer are going to they live with humans where they're going to want to set up you know a lot of it's downwind you know stuff like that so um yeah, so I do have just kind of all of the above. I'll have cameras in some areas, uh, use my woodsmanship in different, you know, scenarios. Um, yeah, so it just, and it is no black and white answer. You know, even these deer that I'm scouting here up north, you know, with that clear cut where they're feeding, something could change. Like, so I found the shed where that buck was, where I was hunting him early October, and he disappeared. Um I bumped them early October and he just like, there are no deer come out in that open cut, like until after dark and he didn't even come out. So, um, blew him out of there. And like I said, I didn't know the area that good. And then left cameras there till December, like he never showed up. And then I went back there just to scout and there was this horn layer, just, they're just 
amazing creatures and they're making well roads and working right there in the gun season but there he is i thought you know there was a lot of land i said man he might be a mile away um who knows where he's at he disappeared you know a lot of times we think and they're not saying they don't maybe in during the gun season there's a time they go and hide but um you know if you have enough cover for them they they can they can hide in plain sight sometimes and just they're just pretty good at just professional hiders you know they just they know how to hide from you know so um it's neat to find out horn and and you know have be have like uh start my plan for next year to get them so like i said i went down around that beaver pond i just located and just like i said went through that area and and i can almost close my eyes and picture the map i get to that point where i i know it because that's how a deer knows it. i mean that's what you need to know i mean if you don't know what's over there then i mean you don't know what's going on and i talk a lot about knowing no 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 as much as you can no 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 more you know and until you're you, you know you're ready to hunt um so yeah all right i got a question let's go back yeah. to the let's go back to the early season so uh I've always been historically more of a, a rut. I set everything up for the rut, you know, and I'm trying to become more of an early season killer. I killed this buck two years ago, early season. Um, mm -hmm. So you talked about, you know, some of your scouting is dedicated towards, you know, focusing on that early season. So with that scouting, are you, are you being aggressive with your scouting? But how is that going to apply to when it comes time to hunting? Like now are you going to be able to be more aggressive when you hunt early season because you have like you can push farther and get closer or how how are you going to use that intel that you're gaining now when it how are you going to apply that when the season opens early season next year i think if you know enough early season you don't want to put too much pressure on them you know because they're still if you still got them you have that last hour daylight they're coming out so like last year i put a little bit too much pressure because i didn't know the area i was walking down there checking cameras um when the wind was right you know mid midday two o'clock one o'clock when i know they were bedded down and you know you're still leaving some scent dropping cameras you're sweating at times so i think this year i'll get out in july now that i in my head know what's kind of going on where the feeding is and i know the one buck made and there was another big buck i had uh 50 yards 150 inch deer and i'm assuming he made it too um they get away up in that area country but um yeah like i was thinking that myself what's my plan for next year and i feel like i'll get my cameras out in july where i know they're going to be coming out and feeding um half a dozen four or five cameras and and i'm just going to let them go um till maybe a couple of days before the season and i'll go in the same time at noon one o'clock when it's hot and i know the wind's right and i'll check them and just maybe hang a stand then or something you know what i mean so i'm not putting a lot of pressure on because i think last year when i learned that area i put some pressure on them and it it and it just once i, I bumped I, well i had the one at 50 yards the big one and 45 yards or so and another deer snorted and um that that other one i found a shed to i had him at 70 yards and a wind just somehow ran. I just dropped my floaters and it went right to him and he he took off. And then the next morning I tried getting him before lighty. So um, but I was draw I was on him just from I was, you know, drawing conclusions to where they were, but it was easy kind of when they have that last hour light that they're coming out to feed that, that makes things a lot easier just from my intel then. But I, yeah, I, I like to not as put much pressure on them and, and I got it. What I did is I found a couple other places on the map that have that I feel like I could see them coming out to feed, and I need to get there and check that and see if there's enough daylight to where there's browse coming in because some of these bigger pieces of forest might have the blackberry briars as their main food that time of year. Even in the open forest, um, they grow, but the, the more concentrated they are, the more daylight, the more they don't they don't have to move as much to feed, you know, but. So I got another a couple areas that I want to look. I'm going to go one more time up and, and scout. And like I said, I'm, I'm changing my scouting missions to like times of year, like first week of October, and and then like I'm I'm not exactly sure what I want to do in middle of October. Hopefully, 
I have enough areas with this early, early October that I can maybe still work on them up to the 12th, 14th. And then once we get some frost and maybe start hitting scrapes and, and you know, and then around a whole, whole different area, I feel like, um, I might, so I'm, I'm still going to check out some rut spots, you know, and that's how I really hunted, you know, in the past a lot. When I did my excavation, I, I worked a lot up through October and I didn't take time off till November. So now I'm kind of changing my scouting missions to try to, you know, and then the guy asked me, said, man, I got 20 places. How do I narrow down? I said, well, this year I'm breaking it down to like first week of October or like end of September, you know, up to the ninth, eighth, ninth, and then to the 12th, 14th, kind of like things are going to change. You just got to use your judgment, how it's changing in your area, you know, with the weather and maybe does coming in the heat or moon phase. People look at that, but um, putting pressure. And then again, and changes again, when you get into the 23rd, 4th, you know, in the your first week and, and then maybe the second week in November. So well, if you got 20 spots, you know, and I say spots, maybe like 50, 60, 80, 100 acre areas, maybe that's your, you know, maybe you got 20 areas you scouted. And so it's like, okay, where's my highest odds of success this first week of October? And, and it's good that you got 20 spots. Then you can look at like, okay, this area they're feeding, like the areas I'm talking about, what wind do I need? And then you're just going to, you're like, oh, out of them 20 spots, you five, six of them might have some good early season areas. And then, you know, you look at the wind, well, I can only hunt this, these three spots. So it really can narrow down. And it's great having a lot of air spots. Then you could just kind of, you know, funnel it down to a time of year and, and, and weather conditions, wind, um, with it, looking at a historical wind and, and that'll help you. But yeah, you can really, and then like this year, I had a couple spots for early season and, you know the one spot they moved in the start of, they started logging and then another spot they were uh cutting well roads in another spot a guy put a tree stand and so all them spots you have sound good but if if it's someone else's good spot they might screw it up for you so so yeah I was muted. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I I do have one question for you because you keep you keep referencing back to like Spartan Forge and stuff like that. Is there is that is there a reason why you use Spartan Forge? Like, does it change throughout the seasons when you're trying to do your preseason scouting and stuff like that? No, I mean, uh, I got on board with Spartan Forge and got to know Bill, the owner, real good, and we became close friends. And his work, I use the app. I mean he's trying to build a great app and he did in the last five years. Um, and we're competitive with all the other apps and, and he's just got, you know, he has a military background. He did this stuff and he's just got a man. And I can relate to him with having a, you know, a work ethic like that. And, and I admire that. And, and, and he's just have, he has ideas that I know no other mapping apps, you know, and so he's going to, um, really do good with it i'm on board with them but um the the last thing he come out with this past summer was the lidar imagery which is basically x-ray of the earth and and you know it's, i think maybe he's got 50 to 70 percent of the country covered to where you get the um the real high resolution lidar i think mm -hmm. it's like one to two meter or something like that uh to where like when you 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 put that lighter on and you can if you get it on a 3d you could see boulders you could see old logging roads it's in like when your topo map is up you know you can, even on 10 foot intervals you could see you know how it goes where maybe a drain's coming down the hill but you can't see where it peters out and how it turns you can visually see that with lidar and it's a you know a lot of the guys using spartan forge anymore just serious deer hunters to know um what they need you know and and, and like bill is public land hunter and everybody got on board with the app is just serious deer hunters and you know he, he pulls from everybody and what what we're looking for as a you know um a, a beneficial like tool to help you with these animals and i mean he has the radio collar deer data um you have to get, try to get him on and talk to him you know and deer predictions weather and, and he come out with the cyber scout which is an ai scouting tool that you just you ask it anything about hunting it's going to um give you like an a minus answer as, as opposed to other 
AI um, things that um, people created, but it's specifically geared toward hunting for, and he did it for like people that are getting into the hunting industry or like afraid to ask a dumb question and this and that. To, so, um, so yeah, I mean, and it's everything, you know, blue force trackers, there's all kind of stuff he got out and coming out and um we got also a big thing we have is the uav imagery which is actually he he uh pays a company to fly over in with airplanes and take pictures which blows away any type of um imagery you get from a satellite you know and it's really costly but he, wherever we get uh people buy an app that's where he'll He'll fly, but you'll, I mean, you, and I, what I do sometimes, and I get like this, you can see on Spartan Forge, you'll see it's satellite imagery. And then you can see the UAV where, and you can see the different coloration when you zoom out. And then I'll zoom in where you could see like the transition, I, the I, hard line from the, um, the, the, uh, the UAV and the, uh, regular satellite. And you can zoom in and see, you can see people standing outside. You can see, and it's updated every, six months or a year or so so yeah it's just it's a great tool it, and it seemed as you know in the past couple of years you kind of see him come in and out with different kinds of stuff and it seems as if he's almost advanced past a lot of the other applications yeah. that there is because like when he had first started you know like and i'll be truthful like a lot of people were like oh i don't really know and then Slowly over the years, everyone's like, oh, Spartan Forge, Spartan Forge, Spartan Forge. Look what they came out. Look what they came out. And that's yeah. why I was asking you, like, and, like, you trying to target early season bucks. Like, I didn't know if there were certain applications on his app that did better for seeing the cover in early season or seeing clear cuts or whatever with what you were trying to target. Yeah, and you can go back, and it has, like, on UAV, you can go back in history and see maps. Mm -hmm. you know all the way up to the present and i know this summer he's going to come out with like specific leaf off imagery but it all depends on when you get your you know satellite images um or your uav image when they fly over and take a picture of it. so you don't always get the leaf off imagery but you can go back years you know you might miss a clear cut or something but you could kind of see maybe some um thermal cover and stuff like that but yeah it's just it's it's i mean everybody on board and is a all kind of like-minded people and mm. you know serious hunters and just like bill himself and yeah and he's just really intelligent with um building the app and and so yeah it's a great great tool i knew we were getting serious when they started using the lidar because prior to spartan forge the only thing i knew about lidar is they use it to find like ancient ruins and like the amazon yeah. and they mm -hmm. use it all they use it to try to find bigfoot in alaska but now we're using it to find big bucks so yeah you know, yeah real yeah it's uh it's a great tool man it's it's i mean i don't i don't say it's better i that's the only thing i use anymore it, it you know um and i know i look at onyx and it to me i just everybody brings up their onyx and show or if they show me someone's looking at it, it's like a green it's like just a green blob i'm like this is just so saturated with green. like what can you see you know i don't i don't i don't know you know I've never been an Onyx fan, man. Like, I'm a I use Hunt Stand a ton, and it's just because it's what I've known, right, and used. And I've been looking uh -huh. and kind of dabbling and trying to mess around with the whole Spartan Forge thing, but Onyx, I can't get on board with it. Like, there, I don't think that there's, and I'm not trying to bash one brand over another. That's not what this was all about. But like, it's just it doesn't have the advancement to what some of the other applications have for what we're trying to do. Like, like leaf cover and stuff like that i'm not seeing it on onyx onyx just it doesn't do it for me when it comes to to doing your e-scouting in my opinion it just yeah it looks the same i don't know it's a, one of the things with spartan forge that kind of like piqued my interest was the 3d the 3d and and oh, like yeah. especially us being you know like big woods hunters like you and pa mm -hmm. us in the northeast like it's a it's tough because like how many times have you looked on a map and you're starting to scout and then you go to go out there and you're like, Oh, I didn't realize that it, especially I West Virginia. I hunted West Virginia. Everything is a sheer cliff. Like everything is yeah, giant yeah. mountains and you get there and you're like, yeah, and if you're oh. right with that 3d. I know I was looking at some clear cuts in West Virginia, or Ohio or somewhere. And I'm like, and, and in my, even though it had the topo lines, you know, I thought it was like, 
a gradual clear cut. And then I went up and it was straight down. I'm like, but now that was years ago. Now with the um, LIDAR to 3D, you just, and you can enhance the, mm-hmm. the angle and yeah, you just spin it around and it, it, it helps you visually see it a lot better. So, yeah. so what would, what would be some of the things that you're looking for now? Cause that's one of the things is trying to grasp post season scouting for early season next year. So like, what are some of the things that you're looking for now to try and put yourself in a position to be successful early season next year? Um, so browse in my area with food is King early October. What are they feeding on in your area? Um, concentrations of it too like like i said these briars will grow randomly in open woods but you know a lazy old buck he wants a he wants to pop out in that open you know an hour before dark and gorge right there man he can't wait to feed you know he knows what's coming um so definitely de- basically cuts or, or what they do in our area they do now a, a, like a herbicide spray mm-hmm. so they'll do like a, um they'll do a um shelter wood cut where they thin it and they come in and there's a lot of in, in these areas that I and I'm, and I'm just talking northern PA, you know, they have a lot of undesirable trees, pole timber like beech and and uh, birch that are not going to be anything. And they'll come in and they'll cut them up to six inch diameter trees. And and what they'll do is they'll spray right after to, to kill the, you know, the roots, their root suckers, a lot of them trees. And then uh, it'll be brown for I mean, the understory is dead brown everything and then if you you know there's with the shelter where there's enough light coming in um after two years now you're going to get them the you know the fresh uh growth the um brows and when they leave them trees that they the pole timber and stuff that's und- undesirable that that kind of is a cover for for the seedlings down you know whether it's you know brows or or new trees generating um so it's kind of for like two years until that stuff rots it gives the um plant life to kind of you know succeed and and start growing but um yeah and uh you need that daylight to get in there and 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 get it growing and so like basically we can call them cuts or like what we call them in these areas are herbicide sprays you know um but daylight's king you know and, and um if you can find definitely water nearby um, we're talking early season concentration of some type of food source where they're not bothered. Um, I think early season is a, is a big thing. They don't want to be bothered. Um, even sometimes by roads, but I feel like there's enough cover. That's just like, they don't want to be bothered in general. I think when you get into, um, when the leaves fall off and there's a lot of guys in the woods, I feel like later in the season, they might gravitate closer to roads in these bigger wood settings, or it might go way back in the woods, but, I feel like food is king. Find some open areas, cuts, walk them, and then not all cuts will grow the desirable, you know, brows. You know, it could be just dependent on what was already there. Um, I've been in some cuts where just grass grows. So you want to, even though it's a shelter wood cut, you need to get out and hike it. Look, look at logging roads. If it's just grass, you know, like some areas I found that the deer, you know, are going to be way far and few between man you got to really find where a buck you know if you're getting into a five-year-old animal he knows i guarantee he knows where he wants to be in that september into october area you know because that's when they're starting you know they are definitely i feel like they they can get bachelored up in the summer and kind of you might see them a mile away they're just you know hopping around moving browsing laying down there's no pressure um but as you get into you know october and and you know the, they're starting to break up in them bachelor groups and testosterone's up you know and um also i feel like there's some laziness to them that time of year when it's you know um food is is number one so that concentration of food um water nearby you know bedding some type of security cover um so that's in a big wood setting and then like i said um when it comes to area with mass whether it's you know acorns is what usually whether it's what red white black whatever it may be you know um you don't know what it's going to be from um this time of year march april to you know next year next hunt season october so a lot of times i'll get out you know i'll make notes of where you know sometimes it's a 
talking to black oaks and then when i'm scouting like this time of year i'll, I'll drop a pin there or, um or some whites and and then I'll, I'll hit all these spots and it comes to maybe different elevations too i'll hit these spots in that late september maybe early october um to like find where these deer they got to look for them acorns too they just like you they don't know they don't know where from this year to next year where the acorns are going to be mm-hmm. i see them go to an area that was loaded with acorns a year before and scrape and rub and then i'm like oh okay but they abandoned that initially because they were just in last year's mode and then they, they move up on a mountain somewhere where there is some good mass so um yeah in areas where there's mass um you know i'll uh if i'm scouting this time of year i'll take note of that um and that's going to be king you know again early october and, and that fresh sign you've seen the fresh shit and that try to you know when you get out there in, in your september october just try to watch your wind and where you're um i mean there's difference you know i talk some people say i talk out both sides of my mouth because there's times when i just make noise and go through the woods you know but i i feel like just knowing these animals for so long i know how i want to scout this area whether it's make noise park slam my door walk up to talk to myself then it kind of puts them on ease but you know maybe if you're way up in a woods somewhere you want to kind of watch your wind maybe he's down over that hill you think you know but but uh, and like i said or summertime is different i could walk all through the woods in the summer but you're not going to know where the mast is you could sometimes see them up in the trees but it's hard looking up from underneath you know to see them acorns i try to look up binoculars but when you get into your october scouting you know just kind of maybe start at the ridges where you think it might be at night you know and you see the shit and okay, maybe he's down here drop can and then he might be dropping cameras then, you know what I mean? And um, he might be hunting as soon as you get, or you might just hunt right then and there. So you got to be careful spooking them that time of year because you could turn them, like I said, what I did last year, I turned them deer nocturnal. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, you got to be real careful with that. Um, but like I said, it's situational, a lot of it. You know, you just got to feel the animals out and what, what you sense and what you feel. And sometimes it's personality of deer, like some deer, like a, big old six point shed we found um like he was early season on a ridge over some oaks and he ended up end up seeing him um that first week october and he retreated down into a hole 400 feet elevation way down up in a hollow and i think he probably lived most of his life there this past year away from people and just deer other deer in general they get to that age his ears were all chewed up i got a picture of him in velvet and uh eating better is easy with factors delicious ready to eat meals every fresh never frozen meal is chef crafted dietitian approved and ready to go in just two minutes including calorie smart protein plus which is the one i like and keto get started today and get after your goals discover a wide variety of easy options for the entire day like breakfast midday bites and more no prep no mess meals factor meals are ready to heat and eat so there's no prepping, cooking, or cleanup needed. Sign up and save. We've done the math. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. Head to factormeals.com slash waypointpod50 and use the code waypointpod50 to get 50% off. That's waypointpod50 at factormeals.com slash waypointpod50 to get 50% off. Hunting boots are a critical component of any successful hunt. Whether walking a short distance to your blind or trudging miles through rugged terrain, your feet are carrying the load. Without the right boots, you could give up early and lose out on that trophy just over the ridge. At Midway USA, we make selecting boots for your next hunt easier. With just a few clicks of a mouse, you can decide on what's important, like waterproofing, insulation, size, width, and savings. For just about everything for shooting, hunting, and the outdoors, Check out MidwayUSA.com. Midway USA brand product designers have one straightforward goal. Develop high-quality, technically sound products and deliver them to customers at reasonable prices. If you are immersed in the shooting sports industry and pay close attention to every single detail, you know our products are built right and stand up to everyday use. Who has shooting mats and range bag systems to hunting clothing and just about everything for the outdoors? Log on and shop 24-7 with super-fast shipping. MidwayUSA.com
knives, machetes, saws, and shears, multi-tools, shovels, swords, axes, spears, hatchets, and tomahawks. If it cuts, snips, slices, or chops, Midway USA has it. Find great gift ideas in our huge selection of pocket knives and other everyday carry folding knives. Make a statement or create a family legacy with one of our top-of-the-line hunting knives. We've got a great selection of manual and electric sharpeners, too. For just about everything for the outdoors, check out MidwayUSA.com. You know, been around so long, the bugs and that eating, like every summer, he's just, they're just gnawed off, and he's probably 8, 10 years old. I had a couple pictures of him from three years ago. He was a big deer. But, um, and like his horn was chocolate brown, and it was just, he don't see daylight. I mean, literally, that horn doesn't see daylight nocturnal he might come up to them oaks they're dead and gone but there were some cuts and tops he might come up there but he's way down in that hole he don't come out till the thermals rise and he got everything in his, in his favor and um you know and that's a different animal he retreated to that area and i think he lived down in that hole you know and the does will come down and visit him he might go up at night and they know where he's at i mean it's like you, you know you know where to find your buddy. You know what bar he hangs out at. You know what I mean? It's like right. it's, it's, they're all individual. They're all they know. They're it's like your neighbor, their neighborhood. You know they know what the other but when they they'll bachelor up in the summer and they know. Hey, I'm gonna go see John. I ain't seen him. I was like, if you didn't have a phone, you're gonna go over near John's house, look around. You know well, that's where he hangs out, or maybe he's down the getting coffee this morning. I'll stop and say, hey, there he is. You know. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> kind of how it is you know no it truly honestly is because like you have some big bucks that are super passive and then some that are super aggressive and they just kind of do their own thing some group with other ones some don't it's all they're they're very personality related where like they just kind of do what they just like humans they're they're you know one guy might be humble one guy might be cocky one guy might be passive one might be aggressive you never know what you're gonna get yeah you don't know how, how much pressure you could put on what you're gonna take all right johnny you were talking earlier about scout more hunt less so like in that october time like we were talking about before finding that acorn crop and stuff are you spending a lot more time scouting so like if you were to go so example you were to go to ohio are you and you're there in a five-day window are you spending the first two three days to find that mass crop to then hunt on them for the last three to two to three days or like what do you mean by how if it's like an early season like i don't know where the acorns are if they're Mm -hmm. high low what trees are you know i'll uh yeah i'll I'll hike i'm not gonna hunt at all you know till i know where they're feeding um then i'll drop cameras and i'll also anticipate hunting pressure like there's one area i hunted in ohio um they were low early season and then the hunting pressure came in from low and they ran them up on a mountain so that was just experience and what i learned there so it's like oh i want to get some cameras up high where is there eight, so what, where are the acorns up high if it's an area that i've been in before for you know if it's chestnuts or blacks or concentration or, you know so uh yeah like i feel like there's a certain you know, you need some meat on a bone before you get in a tree. Yeah. I feel like, I mean, there's times you get in a tree on maybe like a, like my West Virginia deer. I just sat back, you know, I knew this one Oak and, um, uh, watched him one night and then I went in the next night and shot him or the day after or something. But, um, for the most part, you know, your best time is your first time, you know? And, and, uh, so yeah, I, I, I definitely want to know a lot and, 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 have some meat on a bone something you could chew on man i mean you gotta have a, something in your favor you got to give them odds in their favor but you still you know and like i said when you scout a lot of areas and then you put so many years in i feel like and i i do feel like i don't need to scout as much because i've i've been to a lot of states and i'm you know it's hard to get out of the same piece of big piece of public land mountain area because it changes every year and you just keep learning more and more you're like i'm gonna figure it out or you're gonna get to that point so um i just and that that just came from time in the woods over years like um knowing the area you know just wanting to know as much as i possibly could whether it was off season you know and i did a ton of summer scouting in the past i don't care it was july and you know i would hike all these mountains 80 90 degrees it didn't matter to me you know that that's what i wanted I, you know some of these bigger woods there's not much understory and 
I found sheds in the summer and you could still see, you know, some scraping areas, you know, from the previous year and, and rubs and stuff like that, just another lay of the land and drop in pins. I mean, there's, a, there's times I didn't get hunting shed to scouting or whatever. And, and, in April, and I found myself in July, June, July, going out there, it, you know, but if you're fascinated with them and wanting to know as much as you can, it don't matter what time of the year it is. You just you know, get after it. Go, yeah, just go and go and go. and. But, um, yeah, you got to ask yourself, is there a good chance of seeing this deer? What's my odds? You know, get in tight to where they're bedding close to the food early season. And even a lot of these older deer here in this area, um, PA, like just over the past few years, I noticed that they're not, you know, I feel like the ruts, I don't know if it's because of the hunting pressure or just a change in temperature over the years or, or what it may be, you know, I feel like the ruts are a little more drug out, out um, the deer are more nocturnal, especially when you get an older age class um, animals to that like a big old six point, he was probably nocturnal right through the rut. He wasn't running on ridges, you know, and a lot of these bucks I'm hunting or they get to that five year old, their chances are they got it figured out pretty well. And they, they want to survive first before they want to breed. That's number one. You know, they, they've been through the harsh winters. Um, they run themselves to almost death, you know, and they know how that felt and they run into hunters and, you know, that totally scares them. And so there, a lot of these deer, I even, made an analogy this year it's like musical chairs to where um you know they're out at night you know like you walking around the chairs they're out moving around looking for the dough and then the music stops the sun comes up and they just bed down the closest dough the closest chair you just sit down and you just stay there and a lot of it is that we could look at scout scrape and all this bs and you know where you know where is he wanting to be come daylight where is he wanting to bed and, and also take note of the does you know and that's one thing i did i'm going to change this year i was just focused on hunting a couple bucks whatever and trying to figure then i'm like whoa where's the doe so I, I and then when you do do your scouting and this time you know this time of year summer in the fall um take notes of where you jump does and and, and he he knows where they're at but um get in tight to you're not going to find that five six year old animal in some of these public areas um walking 400 yards november first second unless a doe is right ready to come in and he has to be right on there other than that he's not going to do it so your odds are really low you know they're they're just not um i'm talking about pressured areas where guys are hunting you know big woods they're just not anymore i mean not anymore i just feel like i think it is the pressure and, and guys are there's good hunters there's a lot of hunters out there's a lot more bow hunters in pa than there used to be and a lot of you know he you know he, when he's a two-year-old three-year-old and he just learns and watches it it's just like it's like a no-brainer i'm not going to walk around and get shot but yeah i mean if he's right on the fringe of reading that doe um like i shot mine this year in pa like she was hot there was five bucks there you know and uh he he did what he had to do. He's he was gonna uh run off his spike. We grunted and he come run like he couldn't help it. It was he was that she was that close to coming in, but you know, oh, that was the seventh of November. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, when they get that close, they're they're gonna run off other deer and be right on them. But that's that's hard to find that that when that doe was that ready, you know, and with the buck to doe ratio, I think also these deer it's a pretty even deal and there's the smell isn't all through the forest you know when you get like five bucks on one doe you know i mean that tells me there's not tons of does and heat you know and all your other buddies are hunting and you'll see one out of five guys oh i had one you know so it just tells you you know it's 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 not the cruising you know i feel like when you get that population really even buck to doe ratio and if the smell's not out there, then, you know, if you go out in the Midwest, it smells is floating all over the countryside and they just dig it crazy. But when it's not that sufficient, you know, they're, they're not going to, you know, commit to trying to walk miles to find one. You know, I mean, there are those times when I'd say about 12 hours in a mature deer's life, 12 to 24 hours. When I'm talking mature, I mean, five to eight years old, that they're just going to walk. But 
you know, you can't wait for that one day. You know, you got to get in. He still has his senses about him. The more I learn about these mature deer, these older bucks, and um, you got to hunt them that way, you know. Um, if you're hoping, and don't, like another thing I talk about, don't ever, I don't hope on, I don't ever hope. You know, I, I did a little bit this year. I said, I said well, because I had a cameraman with me all year, and I said, we're hope on. He said, what do you mean? I said, we're hoping a deer comes through. I said, this ain't good. When you get to that point, you got to do something different, you know. And I did a little more hope hunting this year because I had a cameraman, and and I didn't, I steered away from my scout more hunt less just because I had a guy with me, and he had to set all his gear up. And, and it was like, you know, in the past, it's like I ain't feeling it, you know, just being in the woods all the time. Um I would move and a lot of times this year i sat and stayed in there because i had another guy and he's like oh man we're moving again you know or like we just got here but um a lot of those times i asked myself you know when we were hope hunting um you know i asked myself what my chances were and i'm like yeah pretty low because i just wasn't in just didn't feel it wasn't close enough to him you know uh, the one time i did ask myself i said okay i'm after this big deer I'm probably 400 yards from his bed and this was like november 1st 2nd i'm like this is no good it's just she ain't coming here a fair amount of open woods not a lot of cover and she, you know we sat there just like so i didn't want to get down and leave but um don't be afraid to get down and move and probe around i call it you know just go check an area maybe it's maybe get in a tree for a few hours and and it, it could come back to haunt you but i don't ever like I don't cry over spilled milk, you know. It's like if you get down, I did it. I go down, I spooked a buck, but oh well, I'm just gonna go hunt another one. But I mean, if you're not feeling it, um, you know, it's really a mental game too, not just physical. Deer hunting uh, can be physical, like tough, you know, cold weather, and and going back in the woods, hiking these mountains. But mentally, it's really frustrating, can really mess with you, you know. Um, just not seeing a lot of deer, and you gotta. You know, whatever move you make, you got to make it the right choice. Whatever choice you got to make that the right in your head, or you'll just you'll just spiral out of control. Like I should have did this, and people are like I missed that buck, and they just keep crying. Well, not crying, they just keep saying it. It's like, all right, just go shoot another one, go find another one. You know, like <laughs> my last day in Iowa, I had a 150 inch deer. I knew he was coming. Well, there was a cedar thicket. I knew. I said, "There's a buck coming out of this cedar thicket today." And it was like maybe eight, 10 degrees and we got in a tree and I said, I'm going to stand there all day. Cause he's coming out of there. And, and I was standing all day and I turned around, it was noon. I said, I'm turning around and sit on my stand for 15 minutes. Cause my buddy that lives out there, he said, yeah, they probably won't move till dark. And I was standing up ready and I ended up sitting down for a half hour and I looked up and there was a doe like looking my way. She saw me. So she caught me and there was a buck, the, uh, the big deer was with her, you know, and just that quick, it was over. And uh, she ran or, or walked and he just went with her. But um, I didn't, if you hunt hard enough and you put effort in, because you're happy with your hunt, you know, it, I didn't sit there and be like, oh man, that was my chance. I should have. And I was just like, well, maybe we'll see another. We got five more hours, you know, let's go. So it could be really optimistic and, and what, what decision you make, you just live with it, you know, and just keep learning from it. Maybe take notes, like in the Spartan Forge app anymore. We got the um, journal, to, I journal everything, you know, and that's another big thing that people should do is look back and see where you were last year at this time of year. Maybe there's a doe that he, you know, and then when you start hunting, you got them 20 spots or five, six different states, and you don't remember where you were. You remember, I remember this spot was good. I can't remember when. And you look back and you could say, okay, November 8th, this is where I seen them does and that buck was chasing her. Okay, well, maybe I'll try that spot again. We're up, and then you could put pictures in there, you know, in your journal. And so that's another big tool. Um, in the Spartan Forge app is, is the journal feature to where you can, um, you know, you got to log all that stuff, man. And if you do like make a mistake um, or you thought you should have did something different, you know, usually after like my one week of hunting in Iowa or whatever days I was, I sit in a journal and I'll write every day, but then I'll write like a something at the end to say like, this is what I need to do. This is how I messed up. I feel I should do this, you know, and then read that stuff again before you go into that hunt again, you know, 
Um, cause you get caught up in everything you're doing that the little things that maybe you should have done differently. You might just, it might just go in one ear and out the other, basically. And it's like, you lose it. And then just re okay, I got to focus on this and this area. And, uh, I know I learned that from Andy May, who's a great whitetail hunter. And, and, and I, I, I started adding that in my journal. I don't know exactly how he does it, but you know, this is what I should have done in this situation or this week I hunted here. Um, and, and once you log it, you, you just, like I said, move forward. It's done. It's over with learn from it or look back at it, you know, and, and help you refresh your memory. But, um, yeah. So, and, and while you're saying when you're journaling there and say November 8th, you saw those three does there, do you find that those does in that area or that one doe will come into heat around the same time that it did previous years? Yeah, they say that happens even with like scrapes when it, it, you start seeing a doe hang around a scrape. Like, I feel like that's time to get in there. And then I've had situations where I had does two years in a row hang around a scrape. You know, I'm like, well, it's a big old doe. She's waiting for a buck. But um, it's definitely um, a spot, a, something you want to check, note next year. You know, this was like I shot my buck this year on the 7th. And, um, a buddy of mine, I put him in that spot. I said, you need to sit here the fifth, sixth, and the seventh, and you'll kill a good buck. I said, because that's, and it's got to be a 10 to 2. I said, because that's when this spot is good. And he sat for the fifth and sixth. He said, I got to get going. And I said, well, I'm going to go shoot him. And I shot it one in there the next day, you know. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, they have patterns to them, you know, especially if it's the same does. And yeah, like, the moon might change it or weather patterns or I don't know. We don't know everything that really what makes a, a deer tick and when he's going to, a doe's going to come into heat and stuff like that. But they say it's within reason of, you know, the previous year, unless it's stressed out or who knows what might happen, but it's, it's worth a look and, and, and note that, you know, where, where does are going to be in heat. And like I said, this past year, I didn't make enough notes of where my doe groups are living. So, um, you know, maybe even, um maybe i'll even drop some cameras here in july where i, I think maybe i've seen bucks you know or, or had trail cam pictures of them maybe um through the rut and maybe i'll get close to them areas and see you know see in july just see what the doe population is like and that but um yeah i feel like um yeah it's just the wormhole you could talk forever about different you know situations and that you know but it's it's all good you know john i do have a question a little backtrack you you have mentioned cuts a hundred times today and we had moose ryan glitzky on a couple months ago or whatever he talked a lot about cuts can you talk a little bit about so i don't know how they are where you are but to me sometimes i look at cuts and the deer could be bedding in the cut because it's thick yeah. There's obviously mm -hmm. the food source because you have like all the new growth and sometimes they leave oak trees standing inside the cuts and all that stuff. So two things. Can you talk a little bit about how you scout the, the cuts as far as like, do you go in there? Or are you scouting the perimeter looking for buck sign? And then when you go to hunt a cut, and I know this is probably a loaded question, but are you hunting the, more of the transition where it's going from hardwoods to cut? Or are you actually diving into that cut and, and hanging it inside that cut? Um, well, this past year and a few years back, I was on a couple of mature deer and it seemed like they would, they were in the cut. I'm talking early season. Um, but it was such a, you know, big cut. I wasn't exactly sure where they were bedded. Um, and I was, I found I was my best time. It seems like their transition was around 11, 10, 9, 10. They would. I felt like when the weather warmed up, maybe a, a younger cut when the sun's baking you, yep. you know, he like this bat this past year, this buck, I caught him at 10, 11 o'clock, leaving the cut and dropping down to where it's cooler. Maybe he wants to drink a water. He's layer and he's going to use the thermals to come up at night. But like I found situations like that. But then, I mean, if you get a, a more mature cut, I mean, it could be tough unless it's like a, a younger cut with like some thermal cover where, uh, maybe a single hemlock or a couple pines where you might lay under there all day or 
or you might be able to get in there, but I know a lot of them cuts, you know, once they get into the six, eight, 10 year old range, it's like, you know, that one that was living in there, I'm like, you know, he could roam around at night feeding, just lay down and you're just like, I, I don't know. I don't, I couldn't, I'm not hunting here. And there were right. some trees I would get up and see a long way, but I'm like, I'm just burning days. Like what's it? There's, it's a pretty stagnant area as far as the, the food, you know, it's just spread out all through the cut. It's not like he, it's not concentrated. It's what's growing. There's the brows and he's just, I can't do it. So I was finding him dropping down in the forest, you know, and I, I don't, and I got, I got to check it this year. And I think it was, it was early season. We get that shade um, in the forest, you know, the thermals will keep dropping sometimes. Um, yeah. It's not always rising, you know, and you can maybe, so I got to look at that this year, you know, when I get in there and see if he has the thermals at his back and he's, there were some roads in a cut and he dropped down to where no one's at. You know, I could be down there potentially waiting. And that's another deer in another spot I want to check. I kind of had a, a deer I ran into this year and down low in the in the mature woods, there was some beach brush. And I, I'm going to get through there with a fine tooth comb and see if I can find his actual bed, which sometimes is hard to find these deer up in this area. It's a lot of, you know, there's not, they could just lay down anywhere. There's a lot of cover in that. But um, yeah, in that year, a few years ago, that cut, that buck, same deal. And like I, I would start by putting cameras on the edge, you know, not get in the cut. Um, Cause like you said, you blow him out of there. You don't exactly know where he's at. And I find he was in there, but I'm like, I seen a couple single hemlocks and this and that, but like, how are you even going to get in there? So, um, you know, in that area with that herbicide spray was just kind of down over the hill. Um, it was really open ferns, but a lot of deadfall um, in around there and a lot of, uh, you know, irregular humps and bumps on the ground, you know, you kneel down to a deer's level, you know, and then ferns are three foot high and you got logs in that. It just this is sticking up and he could see and um, the thermals are falling. So I'm trying to find areas like like that that I have some advantage, you know. Um, I feel like a, some of these cuts, like them bucks will come up to the tops in the evenings, you know. And sometimes that that's a hard, hard situation, you know. Um, like them couple bucks they're they're down low and then they could smell what they're feeding down low and they could smell what's on top and i get down there with them you know but when they're down in a mature woods and, and they're going up to that cut at night sometimes you don't exactly know where they're entering that cut but yeah cuts can be tough um yeah. i know i know people i mean this one year there was a buck living in a cut and he he rubbed so he was must have been that age i think he was like four years old four to five he made so many buck rubs in his cut and they were everywhere and he had beds everywhere. I found it in September and mid September, I'm like this deer's here. I bumped him and scout him. I seen him three times that year in that cut. Like he literally owned that cut. And that was his personality. Um, I never got a shot at him. He was a big buck, but he had rubs. He was just, you know, had an attitude problem rubbing big trees and he just lived in that cut. And it was just like, well, I just need to get in here. There's that much meat on the bone. Like he's here, he's living here, you know, and them other situations are mainly most of the time. It's not that, you know, like that was rare for me to find something. And that was like, this is a no brainer, but most of the time it's just like you catch rubs in there, some trails, you know, and it's like, he could be anywhere in here, you know, but that one deer that was in that cut, I didn't, I said, next year I'll get him. And he moved out of there. Um, I think some guys were in there hunting and blew him out of there. And uh, I went in there next year thinking, because I had a picture of him right at the end of rifle season. So, well, he's still around and I'll get him next year. And then I went in there next year. He didn't live there. I didn't I look for him. I never found I found him two years later, about a mile and a half away. Um, he just, his age changed. Maybe the, he was getting to that age where, that he was the hunting pressure was getting to him and he just changed his attitude and where he wanted to live. But you know, with them cuts, I mean, they're definitely food. I mean, maybe if you have a few bucks using them in a bachelor group, you just got to kind of ask yourself, man, I feel they're feeding in here. You know, there's a lot of deer. I'm getting them all. I get all kind of, I got, there's four good bucks, you know, and if you, if you're going to have an idea, like there might be a downwind side of the cut they like to lay in, you know, or, like some pines or something. If you have something that they're liking, 
or they like to gravitate to, you can maybe get a chance on, but it would snag stagnant and just all that same situation. You know, it's, it's really tough, you know, for, for deer to be like, where I said the woods I was hunting with that herbicide spray, I mean, probably this much of their neck and head, but they're, the roads up there in a day where they, they always want to know where that danger is. So they can smell when the thermals fall in the evening, you know, but if it's just like a flat cut, you know, and there's no, like the, just the thermal drop to the ground and there's no, like, you know, there's any pulling down a hill or something. And there's, there's no topo. It's just flat. Like, and it's, he might not want to feed in there. There's a road nearby or, or he might like, I, I don't know. It's like, you're going to ask yourself if he's going to be like, comfortable in there you gotta have something if it's like a road near nearby and he can hear a car coming he might run but if it's like i don't know maybe it's a bike trail or hiking trail you don't like seeing people or i, I but usually you know they, they're uh i'm just trying to figure a situation to where like he might not feel safe having no um you know that they probably in that area they have some visibility if you know if it's not if it's like flat and a long ways they could see see someone coming so it's like something he's probably feeding there so he could see a long ways or using the thermals but anyways the cover something's on in his favor when he's feeding you know what i mean so right. give, them, give them something you know in their favor but you need to be able to get something in your favor too that's like the tightrope you walk with them deer so they right. say the only success that i and i've actually had quite a bit of success hunting cuts is is brought you know first couple of weeks of november just hunting the yeah. downwind edge of it and yeah. i just kept cruising that edge scent checking anything inside the cut but when mm -hmm. it comes to early season it's just like yeah yeah dude, when you fast forward a run i think you're right if it you know if that's a doe group living there yeah you can get a downwind side for sure and you know if there's an edge area inside corner or something that's definitely you know right. and then i think some of these bigger deer you're just going to be careful what the hunting pressure is because like that that one cut where that buck was, he moved out of there. And the next year there was guys in there and it was dead. And, and, uh, the following year, my, I told my buddy, I said, hey, go hunting. I said, it sucks. I said, there you run them out. And the following year, no one was hunting there. He was in there. And it, so you got to figure out, you know, but your cameras, if you're running cameras can kind of tell you what's, what's going on in that area with the uh, hunting pressure, you know, oh look, look, they're here. But yeah, definitely. When you get into the rut, if, if no one's really, and then sometimes I look for a cut maybe way back in the woods that nobody's accessing. Sometimes early season, um, or even during the rut, you know, maybe I, there's no one been back here. There might be a buck just live there, like that one buck. He just lived there all through, you know. I found it October and in through November. He lived there all year. But like it's just personality traits, you know, like how he lived there, and maybe another one won't. But it's just, you know, you can use them maps and that and. But you got to get boots on the ground and drop some cameras for sure and, and that and just learn how they're utilizing it. it it's, it's all, you know, some are short cut, you know, like young, younger cuts, some are in hilly, hilly country, some flat areas. So it's just like there's so many situations, you know, that come into play with, with cuts, you know, and select cuts. And, you know, the deer's definitely going to have something in his favor, you know, um, early season, but, you know, yeah, in a rut, who knows if the does are in, in there, you could be, it'd be great. Just a matter of waiting them out, you know, and then the one area I, I have it's downwind of a cut, like you said, we've shot one tree stand. We've shot now six bucks out of it, you know, and that's where I shot mine this year. Um, you know, my buddy, he, he, I don't know if he missed one or, the year before he shot one, it's just like it's a downwind side. It's rut, and the date's right. We just wait them out, you know. So it takes a lot, and, it, and it's an area the wind's right. You can hunt it every day. You can hunt it every day, every day, every day. You're downwind, you know. And then the wind switches, and you just hunt the other side of the cut. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. But um, and there are those times you find them places that, you know, I probably have three or four spots that I know like. This is a good spot. You could sit here every day, you know, just everything's the wind's right. You got something, you're, you know, you know where your wind's on a downwind, so where, where your wind's going, you know, where the deer are. And I think just years of hunting, you can find like a no brainer spots to you can almost kill a deer every year, you know. Well, Johnny, I got one last question for you, man. We'll close this bad boy right out. We want to know, Johnny, 
What drives you outdoors? I don't know. Like, I ask myself the same question, you know, just deer in general, ever since I was, my dad was a gun hunter and I remember him going hunting and I couldn't wait for him to come back and see what he got. I was so excited, you know, and then I remember, I remember he took me to a spot that he was scouting for um, gun season, him and a buddy. And he showed me what a buck rub was. I was probably eight, ten, and I was so fascinated. Like he had his pen knife. I took all the buck rubs. I cut them down. And I like took them home. And I told my mom. I know pal. She looked out on a porch. What's that? I said, her buck rubs. Into your rub tree. What are you? I'm saving them. That's you know. I was like blown away. That's I knew I had an issue then. You know, just even <laughs> armful buck rubs, like little things like like that. I'm ten years old. I'm like, look, mom, think about this. And there are buck rubs. I knew I had an issue then, like, but um, but I like um, like the hunting I do is to me is pretty tough. I like challenging myself, um, and I think with deer it's the learning curve never ends. Like I know like in life, like my excavation business, I've been doing that for so many years. There's no learning curve. And I'm, every time I go in the woods, it's like, I'm looking, learning, figure and trying to figure something out. It's always new, whether it's the same piece of woods, you know, different deer move in and uh, stuff like that. So, and, I mean, it's exercise and, and mentally exercise, you know, a mental like exercise too, just trying to figure them out and um, just having good work ethic and um, loving the challenge. You know, like I feel like when, when you're in hunting areas that your odds are really low. And like I said, it's a, it's challenging mentally, physically, you know um, but when your odds are low, it's just everything's when that deer does come through, it might, you might sit there for seven, eight days and, it's tough mentally because you need to make it happen. Like you're, you're like, that's a mental like challenge, you know, everything got to be perfect, you know, and, and I've sat for 40 hours and I ain't seen a deer. So it's like, that could really, you have one chance, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, just the challenge, I think um, in, in the, yeah, the challenge, tough, that stuff mentally and physically and um um always learning and bettering yourself and you know i feel like you're only as tough as your opponent you know so i feel like i go after five six year old deer and I'm not saying i always shoot them you know they're getting late in the year i might shoot something but uh smaller but yeah it's it, to me that's the toughest opponent i found is hunting these mountain bucks that have vast amounts of land and um a lot of knowledge for being old and surviving with hunters and you basically surviving with, you know, predators, hunters, and, and to accomplish harvest than one to me is, I don't believe like people, like I tell people, I don't believe in luck. It's like, it happened for a reason. You know, I, I, I like, if you shoot a deer, like, man, I got lucky. It's like, I, I figured them out. I, I sat here. There's a reason for it. You know what I mean? Um, but, um, yeah, so that's basically it, I guess. So my my last question is: Do you still collect buck rubs? I should yeah. bigger ones. <laughs> I bring them home to my fiance. Look, honey, what I got? <laughs> Ten inch cedar trees. Look what I got, Look, honey. honey. Like, where can I put them? <laughs> you know? Why not go over to you, buddy? <laughs> I just put had to ask. Fire. I just yeah. had to ask John. I had to. <laughs> I should keep some. <laughs> a good idea. When I was younger, I had the small ones. Bring them all home. Keep people from coming in the spot chasing the, chasing the buck sign because you cut it all down. Yeah. Cut them all down, yeah. <laughs> I know one guy used to paint the trees along the road. Paint the buck rubs. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, Johnny takes them with him. The other guy paints them. So you, you're yeah. never going to find where the big mature bucks are in PA. <laughs> Most people open up scrapes. We're going to start filling them back in with leaves. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Cut the rubs down, fill the leaves in. <laughs> John, we really appreciate you jumping on with us, man, catching up with you, and I hope that you do catch up with that buck early season and, 
and uh, we'll follow along and see what goes on. Can you just uh, let everybody know where they can follow along and see what you got going on throughout the season? Yeah, I'm pretty active on Instagram, the Johnny Stewart. Um, and like I said, uh, I filmed all year this year, and I'm going to put a YouTube. I'm going to put a YouTube channel out. Mm-hmm. Not all about kills. I mean, we sh- I shot three buck, two on film, and uh, when you're hunting these public lands and taking another guy out there, that was a whole learning curve for me too, and uh, a lot of hopefully educational stuff. You know, people can maybe hopefully look at the situations I was in, you know, and can draw, you know, maybe look at their own um, hunting situation and relate to it and, you know, how things went and what I thought and stuff like that. So we're, we're working on editing that now, probably get it out sometime in the summer going into fall. Um, but yeah, it'd be, it's just the Johnny Stewart on, on YouTube. I think we might have like one or two scouting videos, but nothing exciting. Um, and I, I am doing again this year, uh, consulting for people. If, if anybody, um, you know, I've had some good luck with, with helping guys this past year. Um, usually just dropping pins and on Spartan Forge or whatever, sending me pins and, and talking for about an hour on the phone, you know, and uh, I charge usually about $150. And, you know, for a long time, I would just help as many people as I could. But then it got to the point where um, my time was getting restricted, you know, and, and I thought about all the, you know, the reason I got a lot of experience and what I say ex- to me experience is I've done it wrong enough. And then I'm taking, you know, all of going on 40 years now of being in the, in the woods, you know, 35 years and learning from them animals mainly, you know, and, and not really, you know, you learn from other people, you pull things here and there, but the, the majority of my learning was from the deer themselves. And, and so, uh, you know, I think that's the, the best teacher out there. So yeah, if you want to shoot me, if anybody's interested, you can shoot me a, a message on Instagram or, or, uh, Johnny Stewart hunt dot, uh, uh, Johnny Stewart hunt at gmail.com, you know, but, um, yeah, one guy who just helped in January is an Alabama and he had, uh, he, I t- told him about us, you know, we looked at the maps and he, he called me, he said, he said, he texted me, it's a North wind. Should I try that area? You were talking. I said, yeah, I would go in there. He texts me, he come out, he's I seen the I missed the biggest buck of my life and it's fine, you know. So it made me feel really good. He's like, he come right where you said he was gonna come. <laughs> but then helping other people is my, is also a learning curve to me. So I'm scouting my areas and then I'm helping these guys scout and I'm learning from them going out and I'm getting feedback from them. It's just furthering my education with the deer in general. Like yep. I'm like Oh, this is where I've seen him or this is the picture. So does he come through there? Okay. And I look at it and, and I relate to my spot, what this guy's seeing from his trail cam. So it's like, it, and it's a win-win situation, you know? So that's awesome. Well, Johnny, we really appreciate it. And I uh, can't thank you enough for jumping on and um, for everybody else. Thanks for taking the ride right here on the outdoor drive.